Hey everyone, it's Rich Wiegand, aka Ricky Molina from the Ricky Molina YouTube channel and RickyMolinaProductions.com. Glad you could be with me today. This video is part two in a series of videos that I'm doing about creating a mock-up or an orchestral simulation using music sample libraries. You may recall from the previous video that we were talking about the Nutcracker Ballet decorating the Christmas tree scene from Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Now I happen to choose this excerpt from the Nutcracker because it happens to be a well-known ballet. I think most people can relate to the Nutcracker and Tchaikovsky is not only one of the greatest composers but he's also regarded as one of the greatest orchestrators and arrangers of all time. Many feel that his orchestral arrangements are even superior to such greats as Beethoven and Richard Wagner's in terms of the blending of instruments that he uses and the way he creates timbre and texture and space for instruments to come in and out. That's not to say, for example, that Beethoven's compositions aren't first rate at all. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying as far as the orchestration and, and the arrangement of the instruments is concerned, I think Tchaikovsky can't be beat. And that's a big reason why I decided to use uh, Tchaikovsky for this exercise. And you may recall from the previous video that we have uh, two reference tracks here. One from Valery Gergiev's uh, Kirov Orchestra, the Russian Ballet Orchestra, and the other from Simon Rattle's uh, conducting of the Berliner Philharmonic. Um, now this is a short excerpt from the Nutcracker. It's only like three and a half minutes long or something. But it's important to listen to these reference tracks so that you get a feel for how the instruments interplay with one another, the articulations that are used, and the use of dynamics, tempo change, and which instruments really take the lead roles in particular scenes. I think it's a great idea to, to break up a musical piece into scenes because instruments are coming in and moving out almost like scenes from a movie where you have different backgrounds and characters that occupy uh, specific cues. And I designed a spreadsheet that actually reviews the instruments that are coming in and going out from scene to scene according to the timeline. Um, and it shows you the, the lead melody instruments against the counter melody instruments, the chordal instruments, the bass and percussion, as well as tempo and dynamics changes. As you can see from this spreadsheet right here, it's a very good exercise if you really want to study orchestral pieces or any song for that matter to understand how the producer and the artists incorporate different instrumental parts in the mix as the song or the piece progresses. So what I'll do is in the next video we'll actually get into this um, blending and um, selection of instruments but in this video part two I'd like to just review some of the important steps that you should consider when you're mixing or creating uh, a MIDI mock-up or simulation. I'm going to use the term simulation instead of mock-up from here on in uh, because some folks don't really care for the term mock-up. It has a little bit of a derogatory or negative connotation. I'll refrain from using it going forward. Technically, the definition of a mock-up when it comes to orchestral MIDI mock-ups is simply using sample libraries instead of real instrument parts, hence the term mock-up. Okay, one of the things I like to refer to here is a checklist. I've sort of created or distilled some key steps that one should follow uh, when you're going through the mixing process. Now this happens to be a MIDI simulation, so we have to deal with MIDI tracks as opposed to audio tracks that are recorded through a microphone, let's say, or recording live instruments. And I'll include this checklist uh, under the description of this video for you. You can download it from Google Drive. Before you start the mixing process, you should ask yourself, you know, what is the spirit or the soul, the mood, and the purpose of the piece? So when you're dealing with orchestral music, let's say, as opposed to jazz or rock or pop or EDM, techno, hip hop, you're going to approach things from a certain style. So when you start mixing in a particular style, you should immerse yourself into the sound of the style of the music, hence the purpose and function of reference tracks. So let's say if you're mixing country pop, you're going to be pulling down some recent country hits 
and start listening to the sound that that people are after. If anything, just to give you an idea of what to pay attention to during the mixing process. In this example, we're dealing with the decoration of the Christmas tree uh, in the Nutcracker Ballet. So it's a holiday scene. It's festive. It's meant to be happy and joyful. But there's always some sort of mystery and enchantment um, in the case of the Nutcracker. So it's not just, you know, you know, everybody's happy and having fun and dancing away and, and waltzing away. There's always this element of surprise and enchantment uh, and mystery in the music as well. And since it's orchestral and classical, we're going to be staying very organic with the sound. We don't want to over-process the instruments from the sample libraries. Not to mention that they come pretty darn well processed from the sample library manufacturers. In this case, I use primarily Spitfire audios, sample libraries, in conjunction with Vienna Instruments Pro. I decided to blend together instruments whenever, whenever I could. So you're recording layers from different sample libraries. I mean, you shouldn't go overboard with this. You shouldn't like be drawing on five sample libraries to get your violins right. I think if you pulled in two or three different sample libraries, you'll get a pretty good sound. So with that in mind, I'd like you to take a look at the um, organization that I attempted uh, for this uh, simulation. So at the top here, for example, we have the major orchestral uh, instrument groups grouped into folders. I'm using PreSonus Studio One 5.0. You can set up what are called folders here. Now these are not subgroups. These are folders simply for organizing your tracks. I'll explain later on that I'm not too fond of using subgroups uh, to process uh, my tracks in general. I try to keep things very sort of one level-ish till we hit the two bus or the main out. I don't like to, to gain stage too many times because what I've learned in my experience is that if you create subgroup after subgroup after subgroup, the more layers that you create, the thinner the sound becomes. When you add stages to the mix, you thin out the sound, things become more brittle sounding, and you're that much further away from the, the sound of the instrument. So my primary approach in general is to avoid staging and stick to instrument tracks, the individual instrument tracks, um, and then create VCAs, which are volume control assistance. It's, it's a way of controlling groups of instruments um, as opposed to doing automation on individual tracks. Um, and I'll show you how that goes in a sec. So here we have the uh, winds in aqua, followed by the horns. Um, I've grouped the French horns separately from the brass because there isn't much brass in this particular excerpt. It's only at the very end, as you can see here, um, that we have some trumpets, trombones, and a tubas coming in. Um, and it's only at the very end. So I decided to process the French horns, which play a more important role in the piece, um, and group them together as a little folder group. And this is followed by the strings. We have the first and second violins, uh, short and long articulations and pizzicato, followed by the violas and the celli. And then at the bottom here, I have in purple the DBs or the contrabass, the double bass, the big acoustic bass instruments in purple. And I process those separately. If I haven't said this already, the general approach that I like to take when it comes to mixing anything in particular is to Try to get the sound of the individual tracks right. Again, I don't like to group things like the drum kit into one group and process that group. I actually believe that the kick is a separate instrument from the snare, is a separate instrument from the toms, is a separate instrument from the cymbals. And so it doesn't make sense to process the whole entire drum kit as one instrument, even though it's being played by one person usually. And this really makes sense from a frequency perspective as well. In my experience, I've gotten better results by approaching it on, a, on an individual basis. And then at the end, you can, um, you know, mold things a little bit together on the main out or the two bus 
the two bus being the the track before the main out. Uh, what a lot of mixers like to do is send their groups and their individual tracks to a two bus which precedes the main out. But I personally don't even like to do, use a two bus. And what works for me may not work for everybody. But I like to stay away from adding too many layers until you get to the main out. And what has worked for me over the recent past as I've gotten better and better at mixing is you know, following the concept of minimalism. Uh, the more groups that I add, the more plugins that I add, the more brittle and less authentic the sound becomes. And when you think about it, it's kind of like the Occam's razor principle, that the more you complicate things, the more things can go wrong and will go wrong. You know, many years ago, I tried once browerizing my tracks, which is like, breaking things into subgroups by frequencies and, you know, processing those groups after the individual tracks and so on. And before I knew it, uh, I found that it sounded like crap on the way out. Due to the added complexity of the mix due to browerizing, I completely screwed up the mix. It sounded so brittle and, and artificial and inauthentic. So I decided ever since then, to reverse course and go back to the basics and to apply and to apply the minimalist least interventionist approach to mixing and i think this is totally in line with like the al schmidt philosophy of mixing and um, when it comes to orchestral and jazz which is very organic in nature you're not dealing with complicated effects sounds when it comes to classical orchestral music, chamber music, or jazz. Everything is like very real. And the more authentic you can preserve the instrument sounds. So think of Al Schmidt when it comes to organic styles of music, especially orchestral and classical music. So here's the general approach, and I'll try not to get too detailed because I don't want this video to carry on for hours. So what works for me, and what I would suggest for someone approaching like a very complicated orchestral mix such as this, start with a top-down, bottoms-up approach in mixing. And what that means is that, you know, I've got my Ozo 9 here on the main out. So this is top-down because, you know, we're dealing with the final out here, the main out. And I've got my Ozo 9 here, which is in turn comprised of an equalizer it's got dynamics which is uh, actually this is a compressor uh, we have a vintage limiter and a maximizer so we have a faster compressor very light compression by the way not too heavy followed by the vintage uh, fairchild like limiter here and then we have the final um, maximizer here which is like your limiter to get you into the ballpark for streaming um, you want to shoot for about negative 12 to negative 14 dB um, for uh, Spotify, for example, or iTunes. Not too much going on here. Very light processing on the way out. And at the end, I've got a stereo imager. Now, a trick that I learned years ago is that you don't want to play around too much with the stereo imager at first. You can always tack it on later. It's kind of like the icing on the cake. So actually, uh, you can turn off the uh, the stereo imager uh, when you're doing the actual mix. And then when you finalize the mix, you can turn it back on and things sound really beautiful. Now what we want to do is follow the bottoms up approach, which is going to each individual track and then processing those tracks individually, um, but slightly. Again, this is minimalism for orchestral classical music. We don't want to go bonkers here, getting some strange sounds. We want to try to stay as faithful and realistic to the instrument as possible. So this is what it looks like when you import the MIDI from an orchestral classical MIDI website, such as I suggested in the first video. So after you import all the MIDI tracks into your DAW, it'll look something like this. Okay, you've got your MIDI here. You got to listen to the reference tracks a lot for each scene of the piece and ask yourself, 
is this particular part staccato or is it long? Is it legato or sustained? Or is it pizzicato in the case of strings? So what I ended up doing is a process called multing, M-U-L-T, multing, where you duplicate the MIDI track. So if this were a staccato track right here, I would only have staccato notes in that particular duplication of the MIDI. If it were a long note, and this is supposed to be a staccato track, I would get rid of it. So I would literally like go in there and highlight those um, notes that were legato or sustain and just get rid of them and clean up the areas um, that were not uh, staccato in this case. All right. So again, you mult the tracks and you create different tracks based on articulation. I find that that's a lot easier than actually using the new function from Presonus 5.0 where you can assign key switches in a linear according to the music timeline. And what that enables you to do is then just use one single track instead of having to mult or copy the tracks according to our articulations. I personally find that what works best for me is to mult the tracks. And it makes a lot of sense if you're mixing other kinds of music you know, if you've got a lead vocal part for a chorus, it, chances are it's going to be processed different. I'm talking about EQ, compression, saturation, what have you, reverbs, delays. It's going to be processed different from verse one or verse two or let's say a, a pre-chorus part. So it actually is a lot easier to process individual tracks according to the articulation that is necessary for that particular part of the song. So once you've molted out things according to articulation, then you have to go into each articulation track and process the sound. So one of the first things that I would do, and I've done this already in the other version of the song that I'll show you in a sec, is I'll take like a Neutron 3, which includes EQ, and I'll actually uh, play back that part, say this part right here, and we'll solo this track, and start paying attention to the frequency spectrum. And notice that this clarinet really has a sweet spot right around there, around let's say 300, and so you really don't need some of this lower stuff. So you can high pass some of this lower stuff and you can make it smoother. Generally don't want to make it steeper than 24 dB slope. Um, 18 dB slope is generally good enough because you want to free up the low end for the celli and the double basses and perhaps the timpani. Um, you don't want instruments competing for the low end. The low end is like sacred. It's even more important than the high end because it has the most energy and it's where a lot of things can get discombobulated. Things can get really muddy down there. So you need to clean up the low end with most of the instruments of the orchestra. And just putting on this simple high pass filter, according to each and every instrument, paying attention to the frequency curves. You know, obviously if you're dealing with a high flute part, you don't need the low end much at all. So you can high pass that out. Now, if you want to, you can also try out some of the presets here um, for orchestral instruments in the case of uh, clarinet or strings or brass or horns. Um, there's a lot available here inside of Neutron 3 that can give you a starting point. But you don't want to go bonkers here uh, creating too many cuts uh, at this point. I would also stay away from too much compression as well. Remember that we're starting out with a top-down approach. So we have this multifaceted Ozone 9, which is like a mastering type of a program on the main out, which is giving us some mild EQ and some vintage compression as well. So we really don't need that much at this point. And so I am not going to put uh, a compressor at all on this particular track unless you really think it is, it needs some help. But once again, the sample libraries from Vienna and Spitfire are so good that you really don't need that much compression at this point. So once you've high pass filtered most of your tracks, now the double basses and the timpani 
are, are a different animal, so we have to pay closer attention to the low end for those particular tracks. But once you've gotten a pretty decent sound uh, from your individual tracks, at that point, and this part here is specific to MIDI orchestral processing, especially when you have a lot of MIDI tracks, that can eat up a lot of CPU and memory. So what I strongly suggest is that once you've sort of gotten into a good ballpark sound for your individual instruments, and these happen to be molted articulation tracks, at that point, you can go to track, transform, transform to audio. Okay, when you click on that, um, you'll get this in PreSonus Studio 1.5, and most of the DAWs have this feature. This is not particular to Studio 1.5. What you want to do is go through this process where you render the MIDI into audio. Um, and the cool thing in the case of PreSonus Studio 5 is that once you've transformed the MIDI to audio, you can always go back if necessary. So let's say you think the velocity or the expression of the track is a little bit off. Well, you can go back and change it um, after you've transformed it. But let's say I click on this. It's going to actually transform to audio, and it takes a few seconds. And once you've done that, as you can see, I'm just going to make this a little bigger, you can still see the MIDI notes here in um, a light in a light hue, but this is an audio track now. It is no longer MIDI. And as mentioned, let's say you want to go back and change a MIDI note or a set of MIDI notes, or let's say you want to remove or delete some parts or change the velocity or expression, you could actually go back in here and highlight the track and go track, transform, transform back to instrument track. So the transforming MIDI to audio is not etched in stone. You can always go back and make changes if you like. Okay, so you've imported the MIDI into your DAW. You've molted the tracks according to the articulation so that you have individual articulation tracks. You've processed each and every track with high pass filters, generally speaking, with some EQ to get you in the right ballpark. Next, you've transformed everything to audio so that you can conserve CPU and memory on your machine. Because most computers, no matter how powerful they are, after you've got like 15, 20, 30, 50 MIDI tracks inside your DAW, you're going to encounter a lot of clicks and artifacts because the computer is struggling to keep up with all the information and it's calculating each and every track according to the processing. You just don't want to go there. That's why you want to transform from the MIDI into audio. You can always further process the audio tracks after you've transformed them. So we talked about top-down processing the main out or the two bus. We talked about bottoms up for the individual tracks. We've transformed to audio. And now we can start setting levels. Before we touch any reverb plugins, we want to get the levels generally right. And I forgot to mention one thing about reverb, because reverb comes into play on the track level as well as after you do your preliminary balances. And I got this point from a famous Hollywood mixer who talked about this in his course. He said that he likes to use the reverb that is native to the plugin. To the sample library whenever possible because it was designed specifically for that sample. So in the case of Vienna Instruments Pro on this track, I will actually go to Advance and click on Reverb and here's the Algo button. Okay, if you click that Algo button, that is the built-in reverb for the sample patch and you want to become very familiar with the built-in reverbs from your sample libraries. And when it comes to Spitfire, for example, the way you would control your reverb uh, would be to actually control the mic mix. Uh, so here you have your close mic, you have your tree mic, and you have your ambient mic here, C, T, and A. And by adjusting these, I always like to keep my close mic right in there so I get a little bit of a pre-delay effect. You get a sense of closeness that way up to the player's instrument. Um, the tree mic is a little bit further back, gives you more like a room mic, and then you have this ambient mic. So I like to pull that down a little bit, but I'm getting most of the sound from the close mic, and then you can adjust the tree mic. 
but try to be somewhat consistent across your library. Okay, so that's how you would control reverb inside of Spitfire as opposed to Vienna. You want to get at least, you know, a quarter to a half, call it three eighths to a half of your expectation for reverb from the music library itself. After you've done balancing, you can bring in a very good uh, reverb uh, such as Nimbus here. And you can try out different reverb presets here. Um, I happen to like uh, classical, uh, like warm, hall wide, for example. That works very well. And if you happen to have the UAD EMT 140, or if you happen to have like say Fab Filters Pro R, for classical, you can turn to something in the large category, uh, the Concert Hall Amsterdam Classic or Concert Hall Amsterdam Modern are both very good settings for orchestral symphonic performances. I happen to prefer the Concert Hall Amsterdam Classic. You could then create individual sends from the audio tracks to your respective reverbs. Now, it would probably make sense for a symphonic orchestral performance such as this, that you stick to one very good reverb. Like I said, Nimbus and Fab Filter, they're both very good. The real reverb from UAD is also very nice. I actually use Nimbus over the Fab Filter. It sounded more natural to me. So I decided to go with the Nimbus as my primary reverb. And depending on the instrument of the orchestra, you would then send varying amounts to your effects plugin, okay, your effects track. Something like, for example, the bass, the double basses, they really don't need much reverb, so you keep it kind of minimal for the case of basses. But if you're dealing with, say, flutes or strings, you know, high mid strings especially, you know, slide it out a little bit more to give yourself a little bit more of a reverb uh, effect. But the important point is that we are sending all the instruments, all these audio tracks to one reverb plugin that sort of blankets everything into the same concert hall. And that's the objective here. What you don't want to do is to send each and every track to a different type of reverb. When it comes to orchestral, uh, symphonic performances especially, you want to create the impression as though you're sitting in one chamber, one hall. Not that each instrument of the orchestra is sitting in its own little capsule or space. You want it to sound very unified. So reverb is broken up into two parts. On the individual instrument from inside the sample library and the overall single plugin where each of the individual audio tracks are being sent to the FX plugin, in this case Nimbus. But before you get to that final, that second reverb step, you want to start to balance the tracks. Keeping in mind, of course, that you want to try to keep your peaks under 12 dB here, negative 12 dB, because if the peaks start exceeding 12 dB, you know, you start getting minus 6 dB here, minus 8 dB there, minus 3 dB on this track and that track. The net result is that the main out is going to explode and you're going to distort and clip, which is a big no-no when it comes to digital processing. So as a general rule, you want to try very hard to make sure that your uh, dB levels on the individual tracks are not really exceeding negative 12 dB. Okay, in addition to the overall fader levels, you know, we haven't talked about automation yet. We're just sort of getting a good feel across the faders for how loud the horns should be relative to the strings. And you want to generally start with the most important instruments uh, of, the, of the piece. So, you know, obviously something like strings and flutes are very important in this excerpt and also the bass and the celli. Horns are important, but not nearly so much as the double basses, I would think, the high violins and the flutes. I think those are the predominant instruments. So get your levels right on those across the board. Next, you can seriously consider activating the volume automation lanes. So in Studio One, for example, 
the way you would activate the automation track would be to go over to this pull down menu here and uh, click where it says display off and turn on the volume automation lane and then you can make adjustments accordingly um, as you see fit but what I ended up doing actually was getting the major faders in the general ballpark and then using VCAs and I will confess to you that I was not a good mixer at all until I started using VCAs. I think VCAs more than subgroups are the solution to making very good mixes. You know, in combination with the volume automation lanes as I just showed you. So in this case I'm highlighting all the double bases and you right click and you create a VCA track. Okay. So I would right click and it says add VCA for selected tracks for, for selected channels click on that and um, you have just created a VCA track here at the bottom this track right here and you can call it DB or however you like to label it now I already created a VCA for the double bases and I don't need to create another one so I'll just right click on this one we just we just created and remove it but as you can see here I've got VCAs for all the instruments of the orchestra that are used in this particular piece with the exception of the harp which is its own instrument pretty much and the timpani again a very particular type of sound so it makes sense to group the piccolos together for example and the flutes the clarinets etc and as you can see here I've actually created automations for each instrument of the orchestra and that's in addition to the individual volume automations that you can insert for each articulation track at the bottom here you'll notice that I've got a volume automation for the main out this is the most important volume automation of them all because this overrides and controls the VCAs which in turn manage the respective instruments as well Again, I can't stress how important this is to creating a very good orchestral mock-up simulation as well as for mixing any type of song in general. The more you can use VCAs, volume automations on individual tracks, on instruments, on groups of instruments, and then on the main out as well, uh, the better your mix is going to sound and the less you're going to need to depend on these plugins like compression to take care of dynamic issues which should have been addressed by these volume automations in the first place trust me the better you get at volume automation and VCA automation and then the main out automation of your dynamics the better your music is going to sound let's say you've gotten to this point and you're starting to get really excited about things well now you gotta sort of work back and forth between mono and stereo mixing and there are many reasons why it really makes sense to mix in mono in addition to stereo and I won't go into them now because there are a bunch of videos out there that talk about this subject in great detail so I don't think this is a good place or time to do that but basically the reason why you want to mix in mono is because you get to hear pretty much what the mix is going to sound like on the average person's uh, speaker system you know when you walk into a store um, or you drive in a car or even walking around your room with speakers or even on your cell phone you've got these little little speakers you'll you'll listen to mono most of the time very rarely do people have the luxury of listening on headphones or really have the luxury to sit down in a chair right in between the equilateral distance of the of the speaker system so that they can appreciate stereo that doesn't really happen most of the time and also to make sure you get the mid-range right and you're not losing instruments I mean if you can get your mix to sound great in mono you have yourself an awesome mix on a stereo system and the way you would test that is you'd actually start listening to your piece and click on a mono button here channel mode now we're listening to the piece in mono Now I'm using my headphones here. So you can notice problems that you would never notice if you were mixing in stereo by listening to the mono version of your mix.
An even purer way to get to the mono evaluation process is to click on a button on your interface which will switch things into mono, turn off one of your speakers, and listen exclusively to one speaker. So you've got a mono output from the inter interface going into literally one speaker. And that's the speaker you want to listen to in a decent listening space, an acoustically treated room if you can. And, you know, pay attention to what you get out of that single cube. And then check your balances, check your VCAs. You may want to make some adjustments to your VCA tracks just so that things sound more balanced and even, just more pleasant in general. Once you've done that, you can go back and, and then knock your socks off in stereo. Now, one of the things that I found while doing this orchestral simulation exercise is that it really helps to take breaks. I did not mix this orchestral simulation in a day or two or three. It took me about two weeks, you know, chipping away at it, taking care of this issue first, following the checklist, slowly making progress, checking the mix in mono, going back to stereo, adjusting the VCAs, maybe tweaking the plugins, tweaking the articulations a little bit, till I finally started to get a good feel for the way it should sound. It took me almost two weeks. I personally don't understand how a professional mixer can mix two songs in a day. I don't believe it's possible to do a good job like that. I think it takes at least a couple of days. I mean, Bob Clearmountain, who is this great mixer from, you know, Bruce Springsteen and all these great artists from the 70s and the 80s. Clear Mountain once said that the more complex the piece is, or the mix is, the more breaks he had to take. He would literally go take the dog for a walk, um, take naps, uh, just keep your ears fresh, because if you do this for hours on end, you start to experience ear fatigue, and you lose your perspective. So why should you continue under such duress? That's no fun. Why don't you come back to it in a day or two with a fresh pair of ears and then see what you can do from there. But I don't think it's possible to do a good job on a mix inside of a day. I don't think you can truly appreciate the song in itself. Some are quicker than others at getting it, but I still don't believe it's possible to do an excellent job inside of a day, unless you're some amazing, really experienced mixing engineer. Now, one of the things you may consider doing after you start really liking your mix is uh, you may want to consider adding some parallel compression to the main out or the two bus. And in Studio One, the way you can do that is by, um, you know, clicking on this little circle button at the bottom and then this little branch here. And as you can see, I've literally split the track up into uh, two parts here. This is the regular mix on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I've uh, added a parallel compression track. And that's one of the things you can do to sort of give your mix a little bit of depth on the way out. Okay, so we're approaching the finishing touches of this mix project. Next thing you wanna check for is whether you can hear individual instruments clearly, and if any of the instruments are a little bit muddy. So one of the things you could do with strings, for example, is you can just do a slight dip here to take out some of the muddiness around 1,000, 1,500 or so. That'll give your uh, strings a little bit more clarity if you want to take out some of the scratchiness from the strings in some, some instances. Some parts you may need that scratchiness, so it depends. Uh, let's solo this track as an example real quick. So I took out some of the scratchiness here a little bit. If that's without it. Without. Okay, so there's an example of how you can use some uh, subtractive EQ. If you want to accentuate some of the instrument, you can of course do a little bit of a boost or a high shelf to add some presence. Another thing you want to check for is overlapping instruments. 
because sometimes the instruments of the orchestra are going to compete for space in the frequency spectrum, especially for instruments that are in the same general range. If we take, for example, um, violins here against the flutes. Here I've got two neutron plugins instantiated on the flute longs and on the string longs, in this case the violins. Now one way you can test for overlapping instruments is by soloing the two respective instruments if you suspect masking is going on. So you're trying to listen for potential overlapping of notes. Okay, so in this case, we're dealing with Tchaikovsky, number one. That helps big time because Tchaikovsky was aware of this problem. And when he ranges and orchestrates his music, chances are you don't have to worry that much about masking. And that's what I found while doing this exercise. It was so well orchestrated. And if you pan things properly in the stereo spectrum, you shouldn't worry too much may not be the case for other composers, but in this case I found that there was hardly any overlap anywhere. The instrumentation was chosen so well that there was hardly any overlapping anywhere. A second way to check for masking though is to use a plugin like Neutron and I'm gonna open up one of them here and uh, play it back. So we have the violin Neutron uh, instantiation here and we're going to pull it up against the flute slongs and we're going to compare the frequencies. And if I pull up the violins, you notice that the flutes start to drown out a little bit. And wherever you see these orange bars and shades turning red, they're not really turning that red because Again, this is Tchaikovsky. But if I were to pull down the violins a little bit, give the flutes some more breathing room up here around um, up here around 2000, you notice that there isn't anything really turning red here. If there were a significant masking issue, a neutron would be flashing this in uh, shades of red. And as you can see, they're in blue. So we don't have that much of a masking issue between the high violins and, in this case, the flutes. Now we get a little bit of more of a problem. As you can see, it's turning a little darker blue. But if I pull this down a little bit, you know, just, you know, a couple of dB, two, three dB. So that's another way to test for masking issues. But as you can see, a lot of it has to deal with the choice of instruments in the arrangement. If you got two instruments that are competing for the same frequency range, one of the things you can do is drop one of the two instruments. Do you really need that secondary instrument at all? Number one. Number two, if you really do need that instrument, well, you may want to consider rewriting that part in a different register. Maybe we can write that part for the secondary instrument, in this case for the violins. Maybe we can give it to the violas instead and play it in an octave down. So we're creating frequency space that way. Now the final tweaks when it comes to the stereo uh, mixing process is you can instantiate uh, a program like uh, the Stereo Imager from Ozone. There are a bunch of them. Waves makes, makes them as well. And according to the uh, frequency ranges, which you can adjust here by moving these uh, sliders or hitting the Learn button, you can increase the stereo width according to the frequency ranges. And that's one of the things you want to keep in mind, especially when it comes to orchestral music, is you want the, the lower frequencies to, to be more mono. So like the double basses and the celli and the timpani, they really should be up the middle. And this may be in defiance of traditional classical orchestration, but I don't care because I don't think the basses should be off to the right as they are in concert halls. I think the basses should have been placed center, far back. 
okay, where you currently see the tubas, for example, in some orchestras. I think the basses should be center a little bit far in the back, okay? So that's the way I like to mix the classical pieces. The true, the purists are going to mix the double basses to the right, and that's fine. But I think that due to the sonic nature of the double bass, low frequencies in the subs, you know, it spreads out across the stereo spectrum anyways, because we're dealing with such low, high energy frequencies. And so that's what you do here. You pull these, um, this a little bit down here to collapse the low frequencies. And anything that's sort of like the branches of the tree, the higher frequencies, like we're talking about tambourines, cymbals, or the high presence of, let's say, scratchiness of the violins and such, sandpaper percussion or certain types of percussion, shakers and such, they can be put out very wide. Uh, so you can increase the stereo spectrum on those higher frequencies. Okay, so generally speaking, think of a tree. You know, you've got your bass up the middle, you got your cello, tubas, bassoons, etc. You can start to branch them out. You get to the violas. Uh, violas maybe, oh, your perspective, violas here, cello over here, uh, bassoons, and then out to the high violins, and then you get to the high percussion, the cymbals and the scratchiness and the shakers and things like that. And then the question is, well, what part of the tree comes closer forward versus farther back? Okay, so do you want to bring the double basses a little closer, or do you want to keep them distant? And that's a function of how much reverb you set on these instruments, okay? It's also a function of compression to some extent, you know, slower attacks, medium release. That's going to bring things closer to you. Faster attacks are going to push things back in the mix a little bit. But a good way to go about that is to adjust the amount of reverb that you send from that particular audio track to your Nimbus or your Fab QR, for example. Now, another thing you may want to consider uh, taking a look at in terms of your final tweaks of the mix is um, the stereo panning from the perspective of an analytical program such as this one from Isotope called Visual Mixer. And in this case, you can actually instantiate all the instruments of the orchestra here onto the stage. This is in an XY plane where the X axis has to deal with panning left and right as opposed to center. Center is right up the middle, and the y-axis is the amount of volume, not so much the distance, but the volume of that particular instrument. So if I solo the bassoon longs here, for example, um, you'll notice that you know if I slide this around, you'll see the difference in the stereo spectrum. And also you can make it louder or quieter as well. So I'm gonna press play and we'll listen to that together. So I'm going to move it off to the right here. Make it louder, quieter, or more off to the left. Louder, softer. Okay, and all together. So you can see that it's going to take a number of days to address all these issues. Okay, so that's pretty much what I have for today. Remember that you can grab your free checklist by clicking on the link below the description. And in the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Tchaikovsky's orchestration using that Excel spreadsheet that I talked about earlier. If you have any questions or suggestions about how you go about mixing orchestral performances such as this, I'd love to hear what you have to say and, and your input is welcomed by the community. Please like and subscribe to the Ricky Molina YouTube channel if you enjoy this video. Thanks so much and hope to see you next time.